Formal logic is oftentimes hard to grasp and it becomes much easier when it can be illustrated by real life examples. A great example of this effect is the Wasson selection task, but I would actually like to start this video with a more basic example. Let's say we have two statements, A and B, that can be either true or false. And let's say if A is true, then B is also true. In other words, A always leads to B. We can take this statement and make a different but logically equivalent statement by taking its contraposition, which is, if B is not true, denoted by this horizontal bar with a little downward section at the end, then A is not true. Now we have two logical statements, A leads to B and not B leads to not A. If one of these holds, the other holds as well, and while you can wrap your head around this using only the abstract statements A and B, it becomes much more obvious if we tie it to a real life example. Let's say statement A is you are German and statement B is you are European. Now the statement A leads to B translates to if you are German then you are also European, which of course is completely valid since Germany is part of Europe. But let us look at the contraposition, if not B then not A, so if you are not European you cannot be German, which is completely obvious as well. If you're not even from Europe, there's no way you can be from Germany. Note that this real world example can also protect us against logical fallacies. For example, the statement B leads to A, or equivalently, if you are European, then you are German, is wrong as there are other countries in Europe. And also not A leads to not B, or equivalently, if you're not German, you cannot be European, is also wrong, again because there are other countries in Europe that you could come from. See how a confusing rule of formal logic suddenly became intuitive? This is because these rules are actually realized in our world, and we use them every day without even noticing. It's just that humans are notoriously bad at abstracting these things to letters and symbols. Let us therefore now have some fun and look at something even more abstract. On a table, there are four cards. Each card has a number on one side and a letter on the other side. The face-up sides of these cards are A, B, 1 and 2. Now consider the following rule. If a card has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. Your task is to either falsify or verify this claim by turning over as few cards as possible. How many cards do you need to turn over and which? If you haven't heard about this problem before, I invite you to pause the video and think about it. Keep in mind the valid and invalid arguments involving European countries from earlier and try transferring them to this problem. Ready for the solution? First we need to turn over the vowel, that is card A, to ensure that it has an even number on the other side. If it hasn't, then the rule is violated and we can stop here. If the card A does have an even number on the other side, we turn over the odd number, that is the card with number 1. We must ensure that it doesn't have a vowel on the other side. If it does, then the rule is violated, since a card with a vowel needs to have an even number, and 1 is clearly an odd number. What about the remaining cards? Well, we do not care. The number 2 might have a consonant or a vowel on the other side, but it doesn't matter. According to the rule, a vowel always leads to an even number, but a consonant could also lead to an even number. An even number could have both a vowel or a consonant on the other side, so we do not need to turn the two over. What about the B? The rule never mentions consonants, so a consonant can have either an even or an odd number on the other side. We just do not need to check. Turning over the 2 or the B means falling for one of the logical fallacies explained using European countries earlier. If you got that wrong, don't worry, because you're among the majority of people, but I will give you another chance. This experiment is called the Wasson selection task, and it has a logically equivalent but different version that is much easier because again it uses real life examples. Let our cards now be patrons in a bar, with the age written on one side and the beverage they ordered on the other side. Now an important rule in any bar is, if you want to drink alcohol, you have to be at least 18 years old. Now the exact number here differs from country to country, but you get the idea. And now there are four cards. 
One is labeled iced tea, one is labeled beer, one is labeled 15, and one is labeled 24. Which cards do you need to turn over to check if any of these patrons are breaking the law? Again, I invite you to think about this, which is probably going to be much easier for you this time, because the setup is just so familiar. Everyone knows the rule and all of its implications, so which cards do we turn over? Of course we turn over the beer, making sure that the person drinking it is at least 18 years old. And we turn over the 15, making sure that the person does not have an alcoholic drink in front of them. We leave the iced tea untouched, because obviously everyone is allowed to drink iced tea. And we leave the 24 untouched, because that person can drink whatever they want. If you came up with that solution, you have actually made some solid deductive reasoning. But do you see how much easier it was this time? Still, the problem you solved was actually that very hard problem with all these letters and numbers from before. And I think it's quite astounding how reframing the problem can make it so much easier. So what's the takeaway here? A few things. First of all, formal logic is hard, but real life examples can make it much easier to understand. Especially when learning or teaching these concepts, make sure to work with examples and apply all these rules to the real world. And if you can't solve a problem, try to rephrase it or put it in a context that you understand better.